tonight, history comes home. Blowing! Toronto at a standstill as Canada cheers the Raptors. We world champions! From celebration to panic. What happened in the crowd? So why won't the Liberals just admit that they don't want pipelines? Will Ottawa greenlight the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion? What we know ahead of tomorrow's announcement. Well, we call this our seawall. And in depth on the impact of climate change. We can insulate the whole north. What it could cost you. From Canada's north to your backyard, this is The National. Good old Toronto has never looked quite like this, entirely brimming with joy. The downtown basically shut down. The city effectively giving itself the day off. Because after all, today was the day the Raptors came home. I got one question for you. Are you ready? Estimates say this could be up to 2 million people unified by one team and one feeling. This crowd brought a wide stretch of Toronto's downtown to a total standstill. The parade route brimming with so many, it took nearly five hours to travel less than five kilometers. The players soaked in a kind of moment they could only get here only now. It's amazing, everybody's out. I don't believe nobody went into work today. The Raptors now have the key to the city, a day named after them, a street. For Raptors way. Toronto's mayor, Ontario's premier, opposition party leaders, the prime minister, joined the jubilation fans across Canada have been feeling since the Raps Game 6 win last Thursday. And what we saw here was the country coming together, and that's what we celebrate. A celebration for the first Canadian team to win a major pro sport in 26 years. You deserve this in the best way possible. Make some noise for your team, the greatest in the world. Yet steps away, there was a different kind of noise. Gunfire left four people injured, something that just didn't fit with a day of celebration and, frankly, love. With so many police and paramedics nearby, that burst of violence was contained, the mood for many undimmed. And as Katie Nicholson shows us, that response also reveals something about the spirit of the day. A camera trying to capture a moment of triumph, unexpectedly caught a moment of terror. Shots fired in the middle of a packed crowd. Moments of panic and confusion. The crowd scatters. And first responders moved in. A bunch of people start coming. And then people start falling down. And then they start going on top. And I just saw my wife on the ground, another friend, and start holding people. and. Uh, we didn't know, and then we just run away. We all kind of just boom and ran. It was terrifying. It was surreal. It was like a stampede, like something out of a movie. Police don't yet know how many were injured in that stampede, but they know four people have gunshot wounds. None of them are life-threatening at this point in time, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, the, the resolve uh, to the situation was as quick as it was, and uh, we were able to continue on with, uh, with the rest of the event. With so many people jammed into a few city blocks, it could have been worse, much worse. Like, why would anybody bring a weapon to an event like that and then brings a weapon and uses it in a public space? It, it really, frankly, it's an outrageous offence, and it's offence that victimizes the entire city. But Toronto was in no mood to be victimized today. Calm prevailed, in large part thanks to some coaching from the stage. I want to make sure everybody stays calm right now, OK, please? Stay calm. It, we're dealing, I'm getting information that we're dealing with a situation that's not far from here. This is serious. Today would not be about a shooting. Today would be about one thing. This is about love. It's about rejoicing. It's about the Toronto Raptors. It's about you, the greatest fans in the world. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. So that was a dangerous diversion. But as he said there, remember what the day was about, the celebration. The Raptors may have made the celebration happen, but it was their fans who made it so powerful. Chris Glover shows us that experience. Raptors! Raptors! 
As the Raptors paraded in like royalty, fans bowed down to them. I can't believe that we got that close. Ah, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> and overwhelming crowds lining the street 30 to 40 people deep, many taking wild risks to get the best vantage point. This is great for the city. This is great for the country. Go Raptors, Go right? Raptors! Fans came from everywhere. All the way from Windsor! All the way from Melbourne, Australia. And no one seemed to mind waiting. What do you think this place is going to look like and sound like as soon as the Raptors buses come through here? like a volcano is about to erupt. <laughs> Even the little ones practiced patience. That's so exciting because I've never met them before. Well, I've never seen them in person. Most turning this Monday into an extra long weekend. Drew deserves this. Let's go, baby. For those who were working today, that basically stopped. And for long periods of time, so did the parade itself. So many people, the streets were clogged and the chants changed. Lee Van Gibrio left Toronto years ago for Australia, but as the Raptors neared the trophy, he flew home. I, I, I've tried to find words in the dictionary to describe this, but I've never felt this unity in our city, man, in our country. Most haven't. It's been decades since the Blue Jays World Series parade in the 90s. Nira Gupta remembers it. But I think today is better. It's really, really, it seems bigger, better. And I don't know, we're overjoyed. As the superstars came out, all eyes were on one guy. With free agency around the corner, Kawhi Leonard has been offered condos and honorary bachelor degrees. Today, a houseplant. We'll see if the love and admiration of a nation is enough. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. And so on top of the buses, a celebration that really was drenched in champagne and a bit of gold. Players partied with their families, Raptors staff, and of course, Drake. Greg Ross rode right along with them and captured the vibe from right up top. The city is amazing. Look at the turnout. And we ain't even halfway there. We've been on the boat or the bus for two hours. It's not often you get this kind of access. So we appreciate y'all. To world champions. What up, CBC News? We're across Canada right now. After the laser focus it took to win the NBA title, the Raptors finally joined the celebration that Toronto and the country have been having. Want to pop that on TV? We'll get Since Thursday's big win. It's probably champagne over here, so I got my wife over here, too. So everybody's here, my sister, everybody's here. Atop five double-decker buses, they joined fans in the streets and played ball with us, too. First of all, we got to ask about the new heritage. Combed it out a little bit, let my hair down, literally. Uh, just relax a little bit and have some fun, man. I'm going to get right underneath Drake if I can. We're live. We're live on CBC. We're the greatest in the world, the champions. Phones from the crowd captured the moment. The players were documenting it, too. Have you ever seen anything like this before what in your before, life? Oh, man, this is a dream. I'm telling you right now. I'm living a dream right now. The waving and toasting went on for hours longer than expected as the procession crawled through the streets of Toronto. But the delays didn't kill the energy, only extended the celebration. We're, what, three, four hours late, but here we are. Culminating on a stage near City Hall where players spoke to the crowd. This group of guys let me do what I do on the floor. Coach Nick let me do what I do. And now we got a championship. And the notoriously subdued MVP had the last laugh. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Kawhi Leonard actually poking fun at himself today at this rally. Now, you may remember back to the beginning of the season, Kawhi Leonard's first press conference as a member of the Raptors. He had a bit of an awkward moment. He let out a nervous laugh that became an instant internet meme. Some people poking fun at him back then, but today it seemed like everybody was laughing with him. Greg, only you could have crawled on top of those buses and been welcomed by those players. <laughs> you, you've been with the team in Oakland and the crowd out there today. I know it's hard to pick one for you, but is there a standout moment for you this season? 
Well, for me, it has to be game four in Oakland. The Raptors uh, just finished winning their third game of this series to take a three to one lead. And it seemed like there were thousands of fans that had made the trip from Canada to be there from all across the country. And they all gathered at one corner of the arena. They all started singing Oh Canada together. They started chanting uh, We the North. It was an incredible moment. They wouldn't leave. They were there for about 45 minutes after the game uh, and they were ready to come home and take the series at home. Uh, didn't happen, but uh, they went back to Oakland, obviously, and won it. But what a great moment that was, uh, Adrian, after game four. All right, Greg, thanks very much. You are hands down our MVP uh, of the Raptor coverage. Thank you. We'll have more Raptors coverage ahead. First, look at this. A classy moment. Compliments of the Golden State Warriors. Don't forget, that's the team the Raptors beat, and that is a full-page ad in the Toronto Star congratulating the Raptors on making history. Now, if we can turn away from the Raptors' big day towards a pressing issue affecting all Canadians, one that Parliament has now declared a national climate emergency after a vote in the House of Commons late tonight. <laughs> Canadians in overwhelming numbers now accept that our climate is changing with devastating, even deadly consequences. How we deal with that has gone from a concern to one of the top ballot box issues ahead of the federal election. Climate change simply impacts how we live, even where we live. From BC to Fort McMurray to Central and Atlantic Canada, we can see it with our own eyes. More fires, more floods, more extreme weather. All this week, the National explores the impact of climate change in our backyard. So tonight we start as close to home as you can get. Canadians have seen the devastation from recent extreme flooding, but for some, it is so bad, insurance companies do not want to take the risk anymore. Peter Armstrong explains what that could mean for you. This isn't exactly waterfront property, and yet this North Toronto neighborhood is the new front line in the race to adapt to climate change. So the water's and like up to here? It's up to here, and then, oh. then the glass in the basement door breaks. Mike Matos's basement was ruined when a freak storm flooded his neighborhood in 2013. That storm was just the first of many here, fundamentally changing how we think of flood risks. You've got climate change with these sudden storms, you've got urbanization with the runoff issues, and you've got bad infrastructure. Well, the water came... Instead of restoring what he lost, Matos used insurance money and another $40,000 of his own to fortify his house. Well, we call this our seawall. He's built up a concrete barrier around his back door and installed a series of sump pumps. He has insurance, but like many here, Matos wonders how long he'll remain insurable. If I get flooded very often, they'll cancel it. As both the severity and frequency of those storms rises, as outdated infrastructure decisions come home to roost, it's not just homeowners worried about all that water. Climate change is massive. We protect one in five Canadians. The CEO of one of Canada's biggest insurance companies has made climate change a company priority. It is existential for our business. So Intact is using data to drive change, funding one of Canada's biggest climate change research centers at the University of Waterloo. And the numbers aren't pretty. This kind of flooding is going to get worse. And yes, Brindamore admits, some homes will become simply uninsurable. If you're in a zone that gets flooded repeatedly or where the odds of being flooded has increased meaningfully, it'll, it'll be hard to find insurance from private capitals. For decades, our society debated whether these changes were actually happening and even if they were, was anything going to change in our neighborhoods? Well now, clearly the risk is all too real, but it's no longer environmentalists saying that. It's a $16.5 billion insurance company that's in the business of risk and right now it says risk is booming. So, Peter, that's just one of the difficult costs of climate change. But let's talk about the broader bill. Right. And it's a bill that we're all going to have to pay. And it's a tab that's going up every single year, Adrian. I mean, 1983 to 2008, Canadian insurance companies paid out an average like $400 million. Now, though, with so many climate-related disasters, the average has gone up to $1.8 billion a year. 
The insurance industry expects the eastern half of the country to become 20% wetter and the western half of the country to become 20% drier. And as of the end of last month, we had vast swaths of the prairies that were deemed abnormally dry by the Ministry of Agriculture. That rising heat is helping to increase the frequency, the intensity, and the extent of forest fires in Canada. 2016's fire in Fort McMurray, the most expensive natural disaster in Canadian history. And as you can imagine, the annual bill then for fire prevention, that's been on a steady rise, now regularly topping a billion dollars a year. And while one side of the country gets hotter and drier, the other is getting wetter. Bridges, water, and wastewater systems, they were built to withstand these 100-year storms. They now strain as these storms hit every few years. And updating that infrastructure is going to cost billions, but there's no one single agency that is responsible. The big thing here is the, the distributed nature of the risk and the real issue that we struggle with in Greater Toronto Area is that the risk is not localized to one place. Okay, so that is frightening enough, but what I always think when I hear something like that is what on earth are we supposed to do with that information? That's the tricky part, and in a lot of ways that's why CBC is doing this series now, is to try to not just unveil the data, but explore some of that, and those stories are coming up. But it is also important to say Knowing is important. Knowing that it's going to be consumers and businesses and governments at all levels to pick up the cost is the first step of then trying to figure out how on earth are we going to resolve some of this. Okay, Peter, thanks very much. You bet. And still ahead on The National, how climate change is contributing to the slow erosion of a northern Canadian town. Here it's really happening fast. It's, we've got no time to waste. What do you fear? Well, I fear that my house can fall into the ocean. Susan Ormiston explores the effects of Canada's thawing Arctic permafrost, how it is impacting communities and the vital Dempster Highway that connects them to the rest of the country. And Rosie, the debate on how to best manage climate change, that will be front and center in Ottawa tomorrow. Yeah, in a different way, though, Adrian, the federal government is expected to announce whether the Trans Mountain expansion will, in fact, move ahead. The $7.4 billion project would triple the existing pipeline's capacity, but the debate has been polarizing and filled with passion. David Cochran now on the pressure the government is under. MPs can see the pressure on their way to work. Oral questions. They can hear it when they get there. So why won't the Liberals just admit that they don't want pipelines and that Trans, Trans Mountain will never actually get built under their watch? Conservatives want shovels in the ground. The NDP wants nails in a coffin. Why don't Liberals side with Canadians tomorrow and cancel the Trans Mountain expansion project? It shows the political squeeze the Liberals are facing as a government determined to fight climate change while also getting Alberta oil to market. Well, Mr. Speaker, on the one hand, you have conservatives, they don't get the environment. On the other hand, you have the NDP, they don't get the economy. The government insists there's been no final decision, but for weeks now they've been stockpiling pipe along the construction route, a step to help restart the project quickly. It's been more than a year since the finance minister announced Canada was buying the pipeline, 10 months since a federal court stopped construction and ordered more consultations with Indigenous communities. All of that's been done. And while Bill Morneau isn't saying if it's been enough to satisfy the courts, government sources tell CBC News the plan is for a formal announcement of the decision one way or another to come after markets close on Tuesday. Another sign as to where this decision might be going is where Bill Morneau is going later this week. The finance minister is set to give an economic speech in Calgary on Wednesday, the day after this pipeline decision is due. Not the sort of trip a minister makes if he's about to disappoint the oil patch. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. We'll have more news straight ahead, including this scene in Hong Kong after millions demonstrated in the streets this weekend. And we'll have more on the crowds in Toronto, who came out today to obviously celebrate the Raptors.
Crowds no longer number in the millions, but anger in Hong Kong still simmering over a controversial extradition bill now in limbo. Demonstrators want it killed and Hong Kong's leader, Carrie Lam, gone. As Sasha Petrasik reports, their challenge now, how to achieve all that while they still have momentum. Before dawn Monday morning, Hong Kong roads were blocked again, but because of a determined few, rather than a mass of thousands. Union members showing their support, student protesters sleeping off an all-night vigil, and from the financial towers nearby, one hedge fund manager. Hong Kong government should really think independently, just not listen to Beijing. It was a far cry from Sunday's mass protest, when as many as two million people jammed Hong Kong's core demanding that its Chinese-backed government abandon plans for a law that would allow extraditions to mainland China. A pledge to suspend those plans from Hong Kong's leader isn't good enough, and neither is an apology for how she handled the controversy. I think that it is not all about uh, apologizing anymore. It is about uh, you have to uh, make the concession uh, of uh, the things that we are, we are asking for. Some do worry whether they'll be able to keep up the protests. I think the uh, culture of protest is, is in Hong Kong is just like you come out and walk and then finish. Yeah, so no further action. And uh, maybe like after one week, they all already uh, forgot about this issue. Or it seems that way. Two million people, a quarter of Hong Kong's population, is a lot of momentum. Now the challenge for the democracy movement is how to keep up the pressure, to channel all the anger and frustration of the past week into something the government can't ignore or appease. It's not yet clear how that's going to happen. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Hong Kong. Up next on The National, in Canada's Arctic, climate change is shifting the ground below and threatening the homes and buildings above. Joe, standing here, you can even see it's kind of sloping. Right. Yes, I'd say probably it's down a downward slope of three to four inches minimum, maybe even more. Wow. Yeah. If I could roll marble here. Circumpolar North is sitting on permafrost, so now what do you do? You can't insulate the whole North. As Canada's permafrost continues to thaw, it is affecting Arctic communities and the long ribbon of roadway connecting them to the rest of the country. And that, as many who live there, deeply concerned. As part of our CBC News series In Our Backyard, the National Susan Ormiston traveled into northern Canada to see what climate change means for towns and the crucial infrastructure that keeps them going. And as she discovered, while the effects might manifest slowly, they are quite literally moving the ground beneath people's feet. Hidden inside an historic church above the Arctic Circle is a story of our warming climate. Be careful, watch your step. Low ceiling as well and dark. Parishioner Joe Lavoy offered to show us what you normally can't see. I've been here for over 30 years and in, never seen a problem until these last five years. Of course, you can see all the holes that have fallen down. And if you look to that side, you see the gap underneath the, the blocking yeah. and the post. Oh, yeah. Right? We've blocked and reblocked several times. One time there was a funeral service going on. There was approximately 200 people attending and the floor was shimming, uh, shaking pretty bad. And so after the service, I asked the father if we could, uh, we should maybe come take a look. And about 50% of these posts were down. Holy cow. Right. The igloo church, as it's called, was built on top of thick layers of earth and solid ice. But that concealed permafrost is now thawing, threatening the church's foundation. Joe, standing here, you can even see it's kind of sloping. Right. Yes, I'd say probably it's down a downward slope of three to four inches minimum, maybe even more. Wow. Yeah. 
is I could roll marble here. You sure don't want it to collapse. Absolutely not. Yeah, that, for sure that would be a real tragedy. The Inuvialuit have been living on ice for centuries, but the town Inuvik was only incorporated in 1961. Tradition is baked into their culture, just like the certainty of 24-hour sunlight in summer and a dark, frozen landscape in winter. But ask anyone here, the Western Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else in Canada, mean temperatures rising a staggering three and a half degrees over 50 years. Most of the Western Arctic is underpinned by icy permafrost, and as it degrades, it's causing all kinds of challenges. A big river. The climate is not just warmer here, it's wetter. We're motoring up a branch of the Mackenzie River, which in winter is an ice highway. Chris Byrne has been coming up here for 36 years. He's professor of geography at Carleton University and works with the Aurora Research Institute. Byrne wanted to show us the dramatic changes in the Caribou Hills at an old camp called Reindeer Station. Walk in the plank, man. Yep. First, we have to navigate the landing. There's about 90 meters of permafrost below us here. And some of that is thawing. The top of that is thawing. Years ago, okay. this was a Hudson's Bay trading post, solidly built like everything else on buried ice. But that scar in the hill was recently carved by a landslide. After heavy rain at the end of a summer, the warming earth simply gave way. This is basically where the landslide finished. And this the wasn't the only one that night. No, no, no. There's 87 other landslides from that night in, in about uh, 17 kilometers of hillside. So it was a phenomenal event. This is a remote retreat now. No one lives here permanently, but the changing geography is the same in populated areas. We have to figure out what we're going to do in the future. And we have no basis to believe that this will not, will not continue. It won't stop now. So then, when we make an investment in a building which is meant to last 50 years, if in 15 years it's no good, we've wasted a huge amount of resources. Inuvik is adapting. An above-ground sewer system is being retrofitted. Flexible space frames prop up some housing but it is patchwork. Back in the 60s, when Inuvik was built, permafrost seemed a more reliable, solid core. We said we'd open roads into the north. It was Prime Minister John Diefenbaker's dream. Free resources could be made available for the people of Canada. A northern road linking southern Canada to the Arctic, a road to resources. The Dempster Highway finally opened in 1979, a construction marvel, over 700 kilometers of tundra. But every year, it costs more to upgrade the highway. Climate change over the last 15 years has pushed up costs by the millions. like the lifeblood of the Western Arctic. Steve Kukel is with the Northwest Territories Geological Survey. He's been up and down the Dempster for a decade. Yeah, the, the Dempster Highway is built uh, pretty much entirely over permafrost terrain. So the frozen ground beneath the road embankment provides a foundation for the embankment. And the actual road itself has a frozen core. But this plateau is warmer and wetter now, and the highway is showing fatigue. So clearly, Steve, the Dempster is falling off here. There's a big hole in the side of the road. Yeah, this is a location. Uh, we have a slope where water is collecting along the side of the road, and the combination of warming climate, uh, the impact of the road and the moisture is causing the underlying ice-rich permafrost to thaw. And as that ice-rich permafrost thaws, the ground consolidates or settles proportional to how much ice there is in the ground. 
and uh, this is one of the consequences of that. Now you told me that across here, um, this happened on the other side of the road first. Yes. Steve um, explains that load after load of gravel has been dumped into uh, this subsidence just to keep the highway open, but it keeps sliding off, leading to a key question. Do we fix it or do we start to adapt differently? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a, a really interesting and important discussion. It really emphasizes or highlights the need to start to think innovatively about the solutions because these types of phenomena are be going to become more and more commonplace. He's not finished our permafrost lesson. A few kilometers down the road, we clamber up to a high ridge. This whole area here has developed over the last couple of years, That's, which is very, very rapid. The head wall here has been carved out, exposing a wide band of ice. So the bottom five to eight meters is all ice. So that's what's thawing. That's exactly what's thawing, yeah. Constant thawing is creating a gully of mud, pushing toward the Dempster Highway, which in time could compromise the road. We've had this debris tongue that's grown about 150 meters towards the road. That, that, that's developed in the last two years. Canada's permafrost problem has become a hot research environment. A recent Senate report identified northern infrastructure as an urgent priority. The challenge is luring international scientists and students like this university team on a field trip to study the ice under the tundra. Traveling further north on a new highway, we head towards Tuktoyaktuk on the Beaufort Sea. I made it to Tuk as a traveler's badge of honor, but this hamlet has become a climate change crucible. Going forward, we just, we're just not building anywhere near the, the coast anymore. We're slowly moving our infrastructure inland. Mervyn Grubin, the mayor of Tuck, grew up here. See all the ice, the land that's melting? Out on the point, Grubin's ancestors are buried now perilously close to the sea. My grandfather Edgar. My grandmother Mary, she died young. The cemetery's vulnerable. With more erosion, it could fall into the ocean. But moving graves is a last resort. I don't know. I don't know. Like we're the whole circumpolar north is sitting on permafrost, so now what do you do? You can't insulate the whole north. The dual threats of rising seas and thawing permafrost are undeniable to Sandy Adam, a homeowner in Tuck. You could see the land eroding. His house is exposed right near the rocky edge. In 50 years, he's watched that coast steadily erode. How far out did the shoreline go? Right to about the middle of the ocean. I mean, where the open water is. That's how far the land used to be. Here, it's really happening fast. It's, we've got no time to waste. What do you fear? Well, I fear that my house can <laughs> fall into the ocean. His house is on an emergency list to be moved inland. Five others already have. I guess they got to move me. Got to move me where I don't want to go, but can't be helped. Why don't you want to go? I'm used to living at the point. <laughs> and the, the cool air come from the ocean when it's summertime and you don't get as much bugs as inland and, and it's better out here. Coastal erosion could cost Tuktoyaktuk up to 50 million dollars, a budget it doesn't have. Hello, here we are. We made it to Tuk. Environment Minister Catherine McKenna, right. on a recent trip to Tuck, was pressed to increase support for climate change costs. Welcome to Tuck. Thank you. Mayor oh, hey, Mayor. How are you doing? So one of the things they say here is, look, we've studied this enough. We've lived it. We can't afford the infrastructure changes that are happening in the Arctic. 
Well, I mean, we've started, we've already made investments and continue to make investments, but we are going to have to rethink how we build things and how do we build resilient infrastructure. We're going to need to work together um, and also really try to imagine what the future is going to be like so that, you know, that communities are resilient to the impacts of climate change. In this land of pingos and permafrost, change has already come. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Tuk Tuk Tuk. CBC News will have continuing coverage throughout the week and tomorrow in our special climate change series in our backyard. What it means if Canada misses its Paris Agreement targets. It either have to continue or in increase the stringency for the policy that is already implemented, um, or it would have to implement new policies. Tony Walker looks at the cost and the fallout of not reducing greenhouse gases and whether carbon taxes really can make a difference. I think it's about the North and it's also about the we. I mean, you look at every color and every creed and race represented, every age, young people, old people. It's a real moment. It feels really special. It feels like it's for all of us. And that's the beauty of it. That is the eloquent reaction from one of the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, who came to downtown Toronto to celebrate the Raptors' victory. Now, some came because they just loved the game, their city, their country because they wanted to make something surreal, real, something simple, something sublime. That got Nick Purden thinking about the meaning of a parade and that took him into the thick of one. If you go back through history, we've had parades for all kinds of things, to show off military power, to commemorate war victories. There was one when we put a man on the moon. Now this one celebrates a sports team, but I wonder, is that what this parade is really about? What do you think we really won by winning the championship? I think we won a sense of pride for our city. I think we definitely won some more respect. Do you guys feel like you did anything yourselves to help the team win? We went to every bar, we yelled and screamed until our lungs were gone every night. Okay, so the bus is about an hour away, the team is about an hour away, the crowd is still building, expectations are building. Little man, how you feeling? Amazing, I'm excited for the Raptors parade! This doesn't seem to be just about basketball, right? It is. Nah, it's about everything. It's just is. about the culture, you know, the team, the city, bringing everyone together. What do you think we really won when the Raptors won the NBA championship? Life-changing experience, man. I've been waiting for this all my life. How I'm so? Glad. How does it change? How does it change? I'm yeah. here, I'm happy. I've never been this happy at this time in my damn life. And how does that feel for you, dude? Me? Yeah. I'm out here smoking legal. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> we not just! We not judge! And is this really about basketball? It's about the city, it's about the country. I don't know what it's about really though. No, eh? <laughs> Let me help. Happiness, respect. And it seems there's also people here doing research. So, uh, really? Yeah. Next year. This year's Raptors, next year's Leafs. Go Leafs, go! Leafs, go. go Leafs, go! There's actually a pretty serious reason a lot of people are here as well. What, what's important about the parade for you guys? We're here for Kawhi, Kawhi to stay. So why not? Why not? Why, why not? not? Kawhi, please stay. And uh, we need you. Do you think you guys have the power to change his mind or to convince yeah. him yeah. where other people don't? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, the parade. They're almost here. They're almost here. How are you feeling? Here? I'm feeling great, brother. To see all these people out here, all nationals, no complexion. Just pretty Canadian people. Love yourselves, Toronto. We never thought it could be done. We, the North, we did it. Yeah. Who's this parade for? For everyone. Toronto, the Raptors, the fans, Canada. Who's it not for? That's Except cool. for the Warriors. It's not for the Warriors. And then it happens. The Raptors arrive. Marcus all just chugged a beer. The fans start to clear out. The parade may seem over, but not for these guys. 
What do you think the Raptors got out of seeing everybody here today? The oh, team? man, this city is diversity. This city is love. And unity. And they will never forget. There's no team that will come here that will ever forget. And how are they you feeling it. in here? I'm feeling love. Yeah. All cultures. Look at this, man. That's what it is. All of this. Look at this. Look at this, man. That's what I feel. I love it. I love it. And really, that's it. Simple. Sometimes a parade is just about celebrating a feeling. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. Canada hopes to serve up aces as they battle against China in the Volleyball Nations League. Men's Volleyball, Saturday at 4 p.m. Eastern on CBC. Everywhere you looked in Toronto today, it was a sea of red. An estimated 2 million people flooded the streets to cheer on the Raptors, Canada's NBA champions. We can't say that enough. Uh, I don't know about you, Rosie. I was born and raised in this city. I thought I'd seen every angle of it. I, the pictures today, I, I've never seen the city like this, and I can't stop thinking that until those last moments, you know, when, when the gunfire started, Everything I was thinking was, I cannot believe how kind people are being to each other. It was, it was totally striking. So I was uh, watching it on TV, as a lot of Canadians were, obviously. And I, at times, just found like a giant grin on my face. Yeah. So sitting sort of like a crazy person in the newsroom, just smiling. Because it really was, as you said, with the exception of that last moment, a great day. But And I know you'll get to it. But man, as a Drake fan, I, I also enjoyed every moment of seeing him pretend to be a player, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know he wants to be. <laughs> Listen, this has really been a remarkable day filled with a whole bunch of moments. So what we thought we'd do tonight is leave you simply with those moments. Let them speak for themselves. Have a really good night and a bit of a... There's no words for it, man. Get the background of the crowd real quick, though. The crowd is crazy. We never see nothing like this. This crowd is mad crazy. who said the world needs more Canada. The world just got it. Enjoy this moment and have fun with it. Aha, ha, ha, ha.